right? So, we got a nice burn going on our cigar here. It'll be nice to see how this thing develops. And it is time to start getting into some brand history. Fun, fun, fun. So, of course we have to go way back. I also have a little family tree I did here. We have to go way back and start at 1887. Okay, so Arturo Fuente, the creator, prime creator of the Fuente brand, is born in Guines, Cuba. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. G-U-I-N-E-S, Guines. Uh, I should have looked at it like I did look at Ibor. Because I didn't know whether to say Ybor or Ibor or whatever, but... Ah. So, 1887, A. Fuente is born in Guines, Cuba. 1898 is the Spanish-American War. So he's born on the cusp of the war. He's born basically revolution. The second revolution is about to happen in Cuba or is already underway. Uh, it was very, very close at hand. America gets involved uh, in 1898 due to the explosion of uh, this ship. Uh, not going to get into that history, but he decides to get out of there and join the rest of his family, which has gone to Key West, Florida. So, right away we skip right to 1912. Uh, like most people who have any sort of fame attached to them, childhood is not a major interest. So, 1912, A. Fuente starts A. Fuente and Company in West Tampa. Arturo Fuente starts A. Fuente and Company in West Tampa. So that's 1912. We're right there. He is born, goes to Key West, and 1912 starts his cigar company and pretty much everything picks up from there. That's all we need to know at that point. From 1912 to 1924, his company is doing well, but it's, it's, it's successful. It's actually doing pretty good. Uh, but there's a lot of competition. There are a lot of other cigar companies around that time, um, you know, uh, coming into play because of what's going on in Cuba. Um, and in uh, 1924, there's a big fire, and the factory burns down, taking his entire business with it. Uh, this is something we'll realize. It's almost a creepy kind of thing that fire seems to plague the Fuente family. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe it's just that they own so much shit in so many factories because they, it, is, it has been said that fire is a big problem in the tobacco industry, you know, go figure. But, we'll see, you know, So the later. factory burns down in 1924, a complete loss. There's very little insurance on it. For the next 22 years, he works at getting money together to start anew. This is a guy who has passion. Because, you know, people's minds change, their hearts change. You know, your factory burns down, you have no money. You think within five to ten years, you start going off on a different direction. 22 years later, in 1946, he opens a new company called the Arturo Fuente Cigar Factory, which is kind of funny because it was just a little operation operated literally on the, in the back porch of his house in Ybor City. I find that really funny uh, because it's called the Arturo Fuente Cigar Factory. A note here, 22-year gap. Cigar company started in 1912, burns down to 24, 20, uh, 12 years later. Then 22 years go by before he starts again anew. So basically, when they do their 100th year anniversary, it's based on the date he first made uh, the first cigar company. You know, there was a big gap there. And you could literally kind of say it was started in a way in 1946. But it's history, so I guess being that it's Fuente will allow all that. <laughs> Anyway, between, before we move on, between those dates, 24 and 46, Arturo Fuente is married in 1930 uh, to a woman, Cristina Trujillo, and they have two sons. 1931, Arturo Fuente Jr. is born, and 1935, Carlos Fuente is born. Um, the next date we have is 1956, so before we get there, Carlos Fuente is uh, married in 1953 uh, to Ana Lopez. They will have children later, and we'll get into that. So now, 
you have a family. You have Arturo Fuente, Arturo Fuente Jr. on one side, Carlos Fuente on another side. He gets married to Ana Lopez in 1953. So in 1956, Arturo is 68 years old. He retires and is ready to leave the small but growing family business to his oldest son, Arturo Fuente Jr. However, Fuente Jr. has a well-paying job at the moment and really doesn't have any interest in it. At least that's what one book that actually gets into this says. You never know. I mean, maybe the kid was delinquent at the time. I don't fucking know, because I think he's crazy. Then again, it's just a little thing operated off the back porch at this time that only started 10 years before this, so maybe it wasn't appealing, you know? Anyway, what happens is Arturo Fuente Jr. tells his father to let Carlos have the business. He's not, like we just said, not interested, whatever, has, has other things going. So, in 1956, contracts are drawn up, and the business, the A. Fuente Cigar Factory, is sold to Carlos Fuente for one dollar. That was a pretty good investment, I tell you. A fucking dollar. Well, you know. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Now, maybe we'll come back to this when we later get into one of our viewer questions. Ah, I went to the camera and my ash fell off. Anyway, some good flavor. Starting to get a little creamier, some nuttiness, a lot of gramminess, a little bit of spice. Spice has really subsided. The smoke is actually pretty smooth at this point. It is strong, though, nicotine-wise. So, 1958, ah, Carlos uh, gets married in uh, 19... 53 to Ana Lopez. Uh, so, 1954, they have their first son, Carlos Fuente Jr., or Carlito, and in 1958, a daughter, Cynthia. Might as well. They, they also, in 1963, have a son, Richard, who really isn't mentioned at all anywhere, but I did find that out. Anyway, 1958. Carlos's wife, Anna, starts rolling cigars for extra income at the Cuesta Rey Cigar Factory, who's owned by his uh, uncle, Raul Garcia. Cuesta Rey, one of the brands currently manufactured by uh, Fuente. Carlos um, has 50 people at this point on payroll, uh, operating off that same back porch. Two times as many as his father had working at the original factory that burnt down. Um, he expands the porch. So, anyway, at this time, Tampa State had uh, plans to build an interstate highway that would go right through the house, back porch and all. Carlos had a plan, and what he does, uh, he, he, he finds this factory in Ybor City and comes up with this brilliant scheme, I think, uh, which in short, he has blueprints drawn up to add a second floor to the current house with the back porch and everything. And he brings it to Tampa City Housing and, you know, gives it to them. And the guy tells him, sorry, uh, this house is due to be, you know, knocked down. He acts all crazy and everything and basically gets to the point where he says, look, fine, but pay me for the house now or I'm going to bring this to a... Uh, you know, an attorney, and there'll be all sorts of lawsuits, and there'll be all sorts of holdups. So, in short, they pay him for the house right then and there. But the idea is that he already has plans to buy this factory, so that's what he needs the money for. He buys the factory. 1962, Carlos um, finds out that an embargo is coming on Cuban tobacco. And what he does is he goes and he buys every bail he can with the money he has of high quality stuff, $250 at the time for a bail, and hopes that it'll be enough for him to figure out what to do next. You know, his father basically told him, you're crazy. You don't even, you don't even really know about buying tobacco. But it turned out that it was very good stuff. And when his father learned from him that there was indeed an embargo coming, and it did happen, he turned his words around and said his plan was actually brilliant. This move 
You know, it goes to show how any little difference in what you do or don't do can make or break you. This move, you'll see, really, it was brilliant and it really saved the company. So in 1963, his, his factory is spitting out cigars left and right. He has a ton of this Cuban tobacco. Everybody else is out already. They're done. There's factories all around him in Florida closing down, falling like fucking dominoes, one after another. Uh, he gets phone calls every day of one company or another saying, listen, I'll pay you double, triple, quadruple for a bail of anything you got. But he very, very smartly refuses. There, even in the book, there are a few quotes like he was really tempted. Who wouldn't be? Make your money back right then and there and then some. Uh, but he realizes that if they don't have tobacco, they can't make cigars. If they can't make cigars, they're no longer competition. And he lets the fucking car fall. We are fall. almost ready to get into our first third report, but let's just move on a little bit. So factories are falling like dominoes. All the competition is crumbling. This is three years worth of Cuban tobacco, by the way. So by the third year, I mean, a lot of companies are gone. By the mid-1960s, Carlos buys a second factory and, has an, and, and enough machines, obviously made a lot of money, and enough machines to make 100,000 cigars a day. Uh... 80% of which are machine made at the time. Curly Heads, Brevis, by the way, both of those brands still exist today. 20% of the cigars are hand rolled, which at the time sell for 25 cents a piece. Pretty fucking nice. So, 1966, the last of the Cuban tobacco is finally used up, uh, and in comes the Flor de Orlando, which is a cigar named after the company salesman. Uh, at the time, and it is basically a Brazilian, Mexican, Colombian filler with a Colombian wrapper, machine-made cigar that sounds crazy, but hits the spot in the market at the time when there really isn't a lot out there. Cuban cigars are illegal in the United States. There is no fucking internet. <laughs> there really is probably hard times getting these fucking things, uh, and it's right at the birth of the embargo, so this thing is being enforced full force. Uh, they really needed this cigar, and apparently at the time, it got them through. Fast forward, 1973, Arturo Fuente Sr. passes away. Also at the time, so families going through some tragedy, hard times, all the rollers that they had from, from the past are all 80 years old, retiring, can't even roll a cigar anymore, etc., uh, and there really are no new rollers, no, no people who are trained in the art, you know, uh, people, less people, I guess, immigrating from Cuba with the embargo going on. It's much harder to get over here. They Basically, long story short, they need rollers and they can't find any. So, 1970s, at some point right after 73, uh, Carlos continues to seek out where he will get the new tobacco. And this is where the story kind of turn, turns around because... The Cuban era is completely over, and now we're trying to figure out where does the company go from here? Where do we get our tobacco? What kind of cigars are we going to make? What kind of cigars can we make? And he tries Puerto Rico, Mexico with very poor results. The cigars that he comes up with just don't meet his standards. Finally, he learns through a friend of a factory in Nicaragua. He goes and he likes the cigars so much that he buys the factory with 7,000, uh, which can produce 7,000 hand-rolled cigars a day with the tobacco and the cigars all in one right away. Uh, the, the cigar factory itself is also very successful, you know, so he buys, right, like I just said, this whole backlog, 500,000 cigars, and uh, turns the factory upside down and is now producing 18,000 cigars a day with 300 workers. 1979, However, we have another problem. The president of Nicaragua is overthrown by the Sandinistas, uh, a rebellion force. And the short of it is, Carlos is on a trip in Nicaragua, and uh, riots start breaking out. All right? He's able to, you know, the story goes on for pages. I'm not going to get into the whole thing. But he's able to basically make his way by the skin of his teeth to an airport, has to bribed several people to get his hands on a ticket, um, gets on the plane, takes off, leaves Nicaragua, and never looks back. Can't look back, because guess what? Fire number two, 
and the factory is burnt to the ground with all the tobacco and cigars, everything. Basically, once he got off the plane on the other side, he calls in, checks on the factory, and they tell him, the factory's gone, it's been burnt to the ground, it's a complete fucking loss. So all that money that he just invested around 1976, 75, 76, three years later, it's gone. Now right here, I just want to break into a little tangent. Comparatively, I think of Padron, because I've heard this story before, and it's been covered in Cigar Aficionado several times, probably in the best detail most recently, I think it was in 2012 when the issue came out, because Orlando has been, I mean, uh, Jose Padron has been interviewed several times, uh, but he gets more into the story about what exactly happened with the Sandinistas. And it really goes to show, you know, again, how little twists of fate, how things you do can change things around. Well, Carlos decided to, you know, listen, I would have too. He turned tail and ran. It takes real balls. Jose Padron, basically what he does is he actually goes and tells his workers, protect the factory, guard the factory, I'm, I'll be back. He goes and he talks to the head, or it says an official, of the Sandinista Rebellion and somehow gets the guy to agree to, to leave him out of it, not bother him, his workers, his factory, and the Sandinista official tells him there will be no more problems. So Jose Padron ends up staying in Nicaragua successfully, where Carlos Fuente, his factory was burnt to ashes and he had to leave. Or he left and his factory was burnt to ashes. So it's pretty cool to me to see these two companies today, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, both world famous, legendary, you know, and all it took was, you know, one little act of saying, you know what, I'm getting out of here, or you know what, I'm going to talk to this guy. Talking to that guy, I don't know, man, that's a, Jose, <laughs> God bless, man, you got balls, my brother, because I do not see myself chatting with any official of any rebellion, for that matter. That's about it. There was one time, uh, Jose Padron tells a story, and he says the only thing that was lost was a tobacco scale. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So, we're on to, uh, we're on to moving on. One thing I like about this cigar right now, besides, you know what, let's do a first third flavor report. First thing you notice is this cigar burns very slowly. I really like that. It's extremely well constructed. It's got a great, great draw with a good resistance to it, but I'm getting good clouds of smoke. No complaints there. I'd probably like it to have a tiny bit less resistance, but whatever. It's very well packed, very well rolled. The cigar pretty much doesn't go anywhere unless you're puffing on it. It does not burn away, uh, and I really, really like that. Flavor-wise, you know, after the pre-draw, a lot of people are always saying how spicy these are. The spice has really subsided. Actually, the smoke is very smooth. And actually, I even want to say the cigar, flavor-wise, is really tasting medium body. Power-wise, it's definitely full body. But... Uh, you know, there, there's definitely not a, a huge amount of full, full flavor here. There, you know, nothing like you get from, say, a, a Tatuaje Cajonu or something like that. Completely different ball game, you know, but um, flavor-wise, started out with a good amount of spice, notes of sweetness, cedar, all of that's still here. It's just really nicely wrapped up and, and kind of diminished, you know, and almost becoming stewed or caramelized where you have just a nice nice essence of cedar spices like nutmeg allspice honey gram very 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 uh, sweet profile cigar uh, with with a good uh, woody base you know I'm getting nice clouds of smoke it's not too creamy yet um, I say yet because a lot of opus X's I smoke become very creamy and caramelized like that mmm starting to develop a bit of a more deeper woody flavor now. The first third was pretty, as far as opuses go and strong cigars go, medium bodied flavor wise. I'll say, I'll say medium bodied. There really is no spiciness right now or anything like that. Uh, but I am enjoying it. it. It is definitely a very well made, uh, very, very good cigar. Uh, especially, you know, looking at Dominican cigars in general, I would say that uh, this so far is, you know, 
uh, definitely upper class uh, among that group of cigars. Anyway, we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so Nicaragua is out, factories burned down, he's looking for other places to go. He decides to go to Honduras. Uh, one of the funny things with Padron actually went to Honduras first and then ended up in Nicaragua. I believe that's the truth. Uh, so, Fuente goes to Honduras and meets a guy with a factory, finds a uh, similar situation to Nicaragua uh, as far as good tobacco, good, good production, etc. Uh, and decides that, you know what, let's do this. He starts making plans to set up operations there. Several months later, the factory burns down. Before he can even get his foot in the door, the factory burns down. I don't believe a hell of a lot of money was lost here, maybe time, uh, but from what I can gather, the factory was never officially opened under Fuente production. It was never actually, uh, the purchase was never finalized. I don't know if there was any kind of down payment that was lost, etc. It doesn't really talk about financially uh, there. However, this was going to be their next choice, and the fucking thing burned down. So that's the third factory that burnt down. <clears throat> By the end of the 1970s, uh, there were only 10 workers left at the original uh, factory. Uh, and basically, Nicaragua failed, Honduras failed, 